a strange substance found by a southwest Arkansas man be part of a government test? Well, that's the question at the heart of a phenomenon called chemtrails, now getting widespread attention. Well, they say the government is dumping chemicals on us to control or manipulate the weather. And they say the unusual looking jet trails in the sky are actually chemical laden chemtrails. People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather leaving what you see there and they call that a chemtrail so what i look up there and i think are contrails you're telling me are chemtrails yes yeah, that a contrail would be dissipated by now and it's interesting dale and christina this is of interest not just in this country but uh, european countries and frankly all over the world a lot of folks interested in it. well dave you mentioned that climatologists and others who study the atmosphere believe that they'd be able to surely spot any kind of signs of an ominous plot. Our journey started in San Diego, California, where thousands of scientists, engineers, policymakers, and journalists gathered for the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference. One of the topics was the artificial manipulation of the Earth's climate, also called geoengineering. During the meeting, scientists spoke about the plausibility of implementing geoengineering campaigns throughout the world under the guise of preventing global warming. One widely accepted theory was to block the sun by spraying something into the atmosphere. When they were asked about existing aerosol programs, they stated clearly that no such programs have ever been implemented. But strangely, these proposals sounded exactly like what people around the world are claiming is already happening. When I found out that the American Association for the Advancement of Science was going to be held down here and the main body of uh, topics would be on geoengineering, I had to come. I, I had to be in on this. I had to hear what these top climate change scientists had to say. Uh, and as the other question about you know, chemtrails and whether geoengineering is being deployed right now without uh, our knowledge, uh, I don't have any personal insight into that um, other than to say that you know, I work in government at uh, you know, pretty high levels in the White House and in, in, uh, at state government. You know, I'm personally skeptical of that. Um, uh, but obviously you never know what you don't know. Chemtrails. On the internet, they are cited as proof of the government creating clouds to combat global warming. They claim the American government, with the secret approval of the national government, is covertly using jet aircraft to spray population centres with aluminium, with barium, and with strontium, so as to reduce people's humidity and reduce the global population. I'm always a little bit suspicious because the government doesn't seem that um, capable to do something on such a large scale. You know? That is not rain, that is not snow. Believe it or not, military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, telesized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now, they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. What happens here, military jets, some come out of Key West Air Force Base and they move off into the atmosphere and they drop my large strips. Some could be a little wider, some are small glass fibers that are coated in aluminum. And what the Air Force does is they take their military jets and they dump these out of the aircraft they fall into the atmosphere and some take as much to a day to fall down this is inevitably military or something going on the government the air force you see this kind of a pattern like this you can rest assured there's something going on they're actually little bitty magnetic and little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum well, it's a nuisance to you and i to determine what's real and what's not but it looks like it is a life-saving operation there's the military the apparent motive behind this conspiracy theory is one world government. Oh, order, order, I cannot hear. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the House that both my ministry and my colleague, the Minister of Health, who have received correspondence on this issue, that this conspiracy theory does not have an iota of truth and that the trails observed from aircraft simply come from jet engines. <laughs> number nine of order. And I think what an appalling example it is of the new foreign affairs spokesperson for the Labour Party that she's spreading Order. conspiracy Order. theories Order. about the United Order. States government. I think the House has heard sufficient. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth system. There are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example 
is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit. Nevertheless, there might be some good reason to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. The big deal really is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles as does sulfur. And that means you have four times less surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes. So that's why we see things like in the uh, use, use aircraft patent from 89, they talk about aluminum. And that's why we're seeing in the surface water samples aluminum. And here's David Keith saying uh, that aluminum has four times the reflective uh, volume surface area. So they'd like us to think that we're talking about sulfur, but here they slipped up and let it out that uh, aluminum is four times better to achieving their ends, and it sounds like it's kind of one they don't want us to know the effects of. Mm. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that. There's a big literature that's already looked at that. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different and normal. So I've told you this cheap to deliver materials in stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought, and that the side effects are harder to manage. And that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere, in, in, in particular, uh, small particles and aluminum. So, so the, the collaborators of mine working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a level pencil and paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the hu human health impacts of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close to being an issue. So 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological. So the alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. The alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. Dane looked at him and he said, so you're telling me that spraying 10 to 20 megatons of aluminum, as you said, would have no human health effects? He took a deep breath and he swallowed and he said, let me be more careful here. We haven't done anything serious on alumina and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It. And that for me, that was the whole main point of, of what is, is going to be coming out to the public. It's, it's the damaging effects of aluminum that are being found around the world in massive amounts. Here's David Keith confronted on this very issue, and he, he looked, you know, at that point like, like they just let the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm.
we haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. They're proceeding because they have an agenda that's separate from trying to thwart this crisis of global warming. You know, there's, there's obviously several other objectives, whether it's depopulation, control, uh, weapons aspects, communications aspects, all kinds of things, you know, wild cards that we know nothing about. We don't really know, and I'm not going to attempt to speculate on exactly what the agendas are, but we can see clearly they're not, uh, they're not, the agendas are not benefiting mankind. You know, it's benefiting the agenda of the elite. And so I think the question is, how do you draw the line between some activity uh, that is allowed and doesn't need global governance and activities that do require global governance. Dr. John Holdren has agreed to serve as Assistant to the President for Science and Technology and Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I look forward to his wise counsel in the years ahead. My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. So what would we do if in year 2040 or 2060 there's a severe climate crisis, say widespread famines or Greenland sliding suddenly into the ocean, that the only plausible way in which we could start the earth cooling this century is to directly intervene in the climate system, say by putting particles in the stratosphere. We do stuff in the stratosphere all the time, of course, and so it's not as though the stratosphere is absolutely pristine. But you don't want to have people going off and doing things that involve large radiative forcings or go on for extended periods or for that matter provide lots of reactive surfaces that could uh, result in significant ozone destruction. You know, maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make money or maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm engaging in scientific research and trying to understand cloud physics or maybe I'm putting this particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make it rain uh, locally uh, to, to see the cloud and get more snow on our ski slopes. And this obviously raises all kinds of questions. It's hugely risky. Uh, it will likely negatively impact some people, but we might find ourselves in a situation where those risks seem worth taking. One of the things that really shocked me was uh, in, one, in one of the breakouts they had the benefits of these programs and then the risks. Now the benefits, the one thing that was stated was the uh, just cooling the planet. You know, some of the risks were ozone depletion, um, droughts in Africa and Asia. I gotta tell you, uh, I came away from this experience after listening to these scientists for four days, four days of symposiums really concerned because it's clear now that they are justifying, rationalizing, and looking to uh, legitimize some really, really horrible impacts, further impacts on our environment. And they're basically formulating the sales strategy and the implementation and oversight strategy and the funding strategy. After San Diego, I was shocked by the programs that had been proposed. I decided to write about it. That night when I finished, I sent the article to an online publication with my email address attached. When I woke up the next morning, my inbox was flooded with responses from around the world. Why? Because I had just broken the story on aluminum in geoengineering models, which I had no clue at the time that very few people knew about. Now this metal, aluminum, is being found in massive quantities way above normal levels all over in rain, in soil, and in snow.